In 9.4, we looked at rational numbers, which we said could be written like fractions. So in this lesson, we're going to look at what we call irrational numbers, and it would make sense that that would be a number that you can't write as a fraction. We looked at these things called perfect squares, and perfect squares are numbers that have a square root as their integer. We also looked at perfect cubes, and those have integers as their cube root, but not everything, like we saw, has an integer as its square root or cube root. Sometimes you get a decimal. So when your number is not a perfect square or a perfect cube, then you're going to get an irrational number. So for example, the square root of 42 is irrational because 42 is not a perfect square. So when you have a square root, it's either an integer or irrational. One of the most like famous, I guess you would call it, irrational numbers that you know is pi, right? And so pi you know as a number that has no pattern, it doesn't repeat, and it doesn't terminate. And so that's what we're looking for in the decimal form of an irrational number. We're looking for decimals that don't repeat, and they also don't terminate. Down below, we've got a picture of a Venn diagram, and it shows all the different types of numbers that you've learned about. You first, when you were first learning how to count, you learned the natural numbers, one, two, three. Then after you learned how to count in kindergarten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you learned about the number zero, so that made the whole numbers, zero plus the naturals. Then after you learned about these, these whole numbers, you then learned it last year and in sixth grade about negative numbers and those we called integers. Now we're learning about rational numbers which are numbers that are fractions and all of these numbers are um, mostly the numbers that you've seen in problems throughout the years. Now we're gonna look at some irrational numbers so we've got pi which we just talked about we've got square roots of non-perfect squares two and three are not a perfect square but 4, 16, 64, 81, those would be perfect squares. We've got a non-perfect cube. 7 is not a perfect cube because no integer cubed is 7. And then we've also got a variation of pi here. So what we're going to do down below is it's going to give us a couple of numbers, and we have to say which category we think it would fit in, and then just give a little brief reason why. So which category do you think square root of 12 would be? Would it be natural, whole, integer, rational, or irrational? The answer is irrational, and it's because 12 is not a perfect square. Okay, let's look at letter B, negative 0.25 repeating. Which category, natural, whole, irrational, rational, or irrational, would negative 0.25 repeating be in? It is rational, and the reason is because we just learned in the last lesson that you can write it like a fraction, because it is a repeating decimal. Okay, negative square root of 9, which section do you think it would be in? It is in integer, and it's an integer because the square root of 9 is 3, so that's just the number negative 3. What you should know about Venn diagrams is if something is in this integer bubble, it is also inside the rational bubble, right? Because this bigger bubble has all of these little tiny bubbles inside of it. So if I land in integer, that, mean, that means I must also be rational. And we'll just say the reason is because the negative radical 9 is equal to radical negative 3. The next one is the cube root of 15. Which category do you think it would land in? Well, 15 is not a perfect cube, so therefore it's irrational. The same way that square roots have to be perfect squares, cube roots have to be perfect cubes. And then I just told you earlier, pi is irrational as well. And the reason that we'll say for this is that the decimal does not terminate or repeat. All right, when you're ready, let's move on.
Okay, so now we look at what to do if you don't have a calculator nearby and you want to estimate a square root. Now, obviously, if you have a calculator, you can just type it in, but this is how you would do it without a calculator, so I'm going to show it to you. If you're rounding something or approximating something to the nearest integer, it's super quick. So you find perfect squares. So let's list out the perfect squares. Now the way that you find the perfect squares is you go through the integers and you figure out what they are squared. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. So what I'm creating is a list of what we call perfect squares. Uh, then 5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36, 7 squared is 49, 8 squared 64, 9 squared 81, 10 squared 100, 11 squared 121, right? Like you can keep going, but I'm going to stop. Okay, so now if you want to estimate something to the nearest integer, what you're going to do is find two perfect squares that surround the number, one above, one below. Then you figure out which perfect square the number is closer to, and then you take the square root of that number. Those are the steps, integer, straightforward. So if I look at my list of perfect squares up here, 87 is between 81 and 100. So I'm gonna branch out and say that's between the square root of 81 and the square root of 100. The square root of 81 is only seven away, the square root of 100 is 13 away, right? 87 minus 81, 100 minus 87, it's 13 apart to the 100 and seven apart to the 81. So it's gonna be closer to the square root of 81 and the square root of 81 is the number nine. So that's the number that it's closest to. Oh, I just wrote on top of the other question. Let me erase that, hold on. I got so excited. So the square root of 81 is the number 9. Negative radical 21, you just do the same thing, only you're going to put a negative sign in the front. So if you look at your list of perfect squares, 21 is between 16 and 25. So those are the two square, perfect squares that I'm going to use. So 21 is between the square root of 16 and the square root of 25. So when you look at who it's closer to, well, it's 5 away from 16, and it's only 4 away from 25. So it's a tiny bit closer to 25, and the square root of 25 is the number 5. Now it gets a little trickier when you're going to the nearest 10th, right? Like what if integer isn't enough? What if you want to get a little more precise? So here are the steps. Don't freak out. I'm going to take you through them. So the first thing is you start off with the same steps as the nearest integer. You find the two numbers that it surrounds. Here comes the new parts. You find the difference between your number and the smaller perfect square, not the closer one, the smaller one. Now in a moment, we're gonna create a fraction and this is gonna be the numerator. Then you're gonna find the difference between the two perfect squares the higher and the lower perfect squares. This difference is the denominator. Now the directions are to do something to the nearest tenth, so how do you turn a fraction into a decimal? We did that earlier. You divide the numerator by the denominator, and then obviously you would just round that to the nearest tenth. Then the last step is you put the integer and the decimal values together. So sounds complicated, and I'm going to be honest, it kind of is, but let's look at it, an example. So if you want to do the square root of 71, we start off by finding the two perfect squares that it's between, and that's the square root of 64 and the square root of 81. Now the second step is different than up above. You find the difference between 71 and the smaller perfect square. So the difference from 64 to 71 is 7. Then the next step is to find the difference in the gap. This is kind of like part versus whole or part to whole relationship. So the part is seven and the whole is that big difference from 64 to 81. So we get 17. 
So the fraction that I'm going to deal with is 7 divided by 17. Now, in an earlier lesson, we went over how to do that. You do 7 divided by 17, and you say 17 goes into 70 how many times? I'm going to think maybe 5. Yeah, that's 65. That was my guess. Um, so now 17 goes into 50. I think, I want to say 3, but that might be too high. Oh, yeah, that's 51, so it's actually 2. And that's uh, 34. Okay, now I don't need to keep going because I can, at this point, round to the nearest tenth, which is going to be 0. 0.5. So the 2 tells me to keep the 5 where it is, so it's something 0. 0.5. And the number that goes in front is the square root of 64, which is 8, because we know that the number is somewhere between 8 and 9. Well, we just figured it out that it's 8.5. So you take the smaller perfect square, 64, and you put that with the decimal. Let's do another one. I know this is a lot of steps. So the square root of 13 is between, and we'll take care of that negative later, the square root of 13 is between the numbers 9 and 16. So now I'm going to do part to whole comparison. So 13 compared to 9 is 4. And this gap is 7. So the part to whole ratio is 4 over 7. So now I do my division. 4 divided by 7. 7 goes into 40 five times. 7 goes into 15 seven times. And now I can see that this is going to round up to 0.6. I don't need to keep dividing. All I need to get is the nearest tenth. So it's something 0.6, and we know that it's between 3 and 4. So it's 3.6. Oh, and I can't forget that negative sign. So it's actually negative 3.6. A lot of steps. Don't worry. If you have any questions, write them down. Don't worry if your question is, I need more practice, that's okay, um, but I hope to see you soon.